shoulders into it. Yay! <laughs> Exercise in that. And then you can move around a bit if you like. <laughs> Get those hips going. Come on. Man. No, no, not the hips, the shoulders. Shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's it. <laughs> Again, again, it's the movement you like, wasn't it? That's what it was. Yeah. If you, when we were in, uh, when we were in Zambia just a few weeks ago, that is a, a choir from the church in Ndola, and actually that CD doesn't do them justice at all. They're much better in a big group in a church without going into a recording studio. Their sound is quite, quite amazing, and uh, we really enjoyed worshiping with our brothers and sisters there. It was great. We're going to show you some slides, I believe. And it's on the way. It's by faith, it's on the way. While it's just um, coming up, let me uh, say that it was not my idea that I go to Zambia. <laughs> um, Africa is not one of my favourite, uh, you know, long-term desires. Uh, and uh, Will was planning to go uh, with another couple. And uh, you'll sh we'll show you their picture in a minute. And... Uh, as we, uh, they made plans, um, I began to feel a bit, you know, a bit an unease within me. And I said, Lord, um, you don't want me to go, do you? <laughs> and, uh, and as I began to actually pray about it, I, I knew that God, there was something that I could contribute there. So, um, so I, I said, okay, Lord. Uh, you'd need to pay for my airfare. And uh, I think it was about 10 days later that um, the actual, um, my airfare was paid in full. That a, a gift, a personal gift came into it. we put them up on the screen it. here? So. Hallelujah. Yay. Okay. The scripture we'd like to, I'd like to bring to your attention is basically found in Proverbs. Proverbs 19 and verse 21. It says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's purpose that will stand. And this morning we want to talk to you about discovering purpose. You'll see about the journey up there on the slide. It says, knowing God. Do you know God this morning? Yes. Well, he's taking you on a journey. And knowing God, then from knowing God, we want you to be people, men and women who will find freedom in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus came to give his life that you would be set free. Set free from this world and all that is around it. The third point was discovering purpose, which we'll talk about this morning. And the fourth point, which we'll be talking about next month, is making a difference. But this morning, God wants you to know that he's got a purpose for your life. Yes. Say, God's got a purpose God's for my life. Doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter whether you're in a wheelchair like Mick or you're running around fit and healthy like me. Hallelujah, that's a faith statement. Glory. But it doesn't matter who we are, God has got a purpose for each and every one of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's, uh, I was able to, to say to God, do you want me to go? Because I'd done step one, the knowing God. And, and he and I are friends because of, uh, I got saved and through the blood of Jesus. I heard the, the gospel and I realized that he'd made a way for me to get to know God. Amen. And, uh, and as I progressed through my Christian life, I began to find more freedom. Freedom from the things that I would never have gone to Africa. In fact, a few years ago... Um, at the beginning of our marriage, um, we got the opportunity to go and run a hospital in Kenya. And I got the opportunity to, uh, to be a midwife there uh, because of a contact that we had there. You were working with the doctor yep. who owned that mm -hmm. hospital, weren't you? And I looked at the idea of going to Africa. My mum was alive then. I didn't, wouldn't leave her. That was one thing. But the other thing was ants, creepy crawlies. <laughs> So I said, no, no, we'll just stay in England. <laughs> so I realise that as I'm talking to you now, step two has been important in my life because I found freedom to do what God called me and not be hindered by uh, other concerns and uh, fears as well. So then, as I was actually praying about whether to go or not, uh, I realised that there was something that I could contribute to that missions team. Yep. So, yeah. As part of that, when Barb and I first met many years ago, I had planned to go to Peru in South America to work as a missionary. 
And Barb had planned to go to Bolivia as a midwife, which is just the next country north of Peru. And when we met, that was the common denominator in our lives. We haven't got to Peru yet. We haven't got to Bolivia yet, but I'm willing to go, Lord. Hallelujah. And we discovered that when God calls you like he has called us into ministry, you've got to have the same purpose in life. You've got to walk together. For how can two walk together if they're divided? You know, you've got to have a unity between you. So uh, we discovered the purpose God had for our lives and that God has got a specific purpose for your life. So this morning, we're going to take you on a journey through Zambia. This is a, a map of our first trip to Zambia, and Zambia is actually right smack in the middle of the country, surrounded by eight other nations, and uh, Zambia was a, a British colony at one time, so English is really spoken really well all across the Zambia. There are seven major languages in the nation, but English is predominantly spoken. Mm -hmm. And it's actually where Livingstone went. Yep. The Zambezi River is there. And uh, yeah, so we were st sort of in the steps of Livingstone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Only the steps. Hallelujah. Yeah. And it's so a David Livingstone. He was he had a great ministry in Zambia. And then as we traveled on, this is uh, uh, the couple we traveled with. This is Alex and Vicky Coatsy from Leeds. And uh, we were in the we flew into a place called Indola. And in Indola, the airport. In fact, this hall is bigger than the airport of Andola. And uh, when you go to get your luggage coming off the plane, it didn't go around a carousel. It came through a hole in the wall, and you just picked your cases up as you walked along. And uh, the p other picture there to the side of the, uh, the picture showing us is Pastor Francis's church. He's the pastor of the Victory Church in Andola. God is doing a great work in Zambia. God is working not just in the Victory Churches, but in many churches, as you'll see as we go through these slides. Here, p rich people have their faith in money, but the poor have faith in God because they know God is the one who will provide. That I mean, people go, oh, look at that picture. It's a great truth. A little boy sitting on an old water carrier. Rich people have faith in their money, but poor people have faith in God because they know God is the one who will provide. When we were traveling throughout Africa and places like Africa where we've been before, they don't have 999. They don't have medical service like we have. But those who know and trust in God call on the name of the Lord and they see the most awesome of miracles take place. So, you're rich. You're millionaires compared to the people we've been ministering with in the past few weeks. Some of them have just got absolutely nothing. In fact, we've got one slide we're not showing it this morning. It's a little girl uh, having a bath, her mother's bathing her, and bathing her in a wash basin. That's the only means of them getting washed outside a mud hut. They love to give, though. They're the ones that gave me this. Yep. Yep. And let me just explain. This is a, a sort of robe thing that the ladies wear, but it's actually all-purpose. And if, you, if you're on a picnic, or as they eat anywhere, don't they? So you put that down and it's a clean area for you to put your food on. Or um, if uh, even your kid knows once wiping or... You know, and all sorts of... It's, it's handy and it's versatile. And actually, it's really uh, easy to pack. Mm -hmm. And then when we discovered yeah. something like that, is something really wonderful for students. In fact, it was a gift from the ladies to Barb and one also uh -huh. to Vicky. And it meant a lot for them to give. But brothers and sisters, we are rich. Mm -hmm. The picture to your left on the wall that's all lit up is showing a, well, it's a street. Well, it's either France or Italy or somewhere like that there. But it reminds us just of what we have got. Reminds us, there's Barb's Bistro on the wall that I discovered the other day. I discovered Will's Fruit and Veg Cart. And uh, discovered Victory Church over one of the doorways. It's amazing what Pete and uh, uh, Mike have put together in that. And the reason that's up there is in, on Sunday the 15th of October, I'm going to receive a special offering for a feeding program in Zambia for Christmas for the children. And uh, today, I thought about today being harvest, but I haven't been here to, to, to promote it enough. So I'm promoting it today. So it's three weeks today, Sunday the 15th of October. We're going to receive a love offering to feed little children like this little boy for Christmas and bless them in Jesus' name. Mm. And that painting, when I look at it, it reminds me of everything that I've got. I am rich beyond measure. 
and I want to bless those who are my brothers and sisters. Okay, this is the Indola Church in uh, Zambia. And this is the very first church we got to. We got off the plane at 2.30 in the afternoon and we were speaking at 4 o'clock. They, they give you a lot of time to rest when you go to these countries, so they do. And uh, the Indola Church was amazing. That's where the choir was. You've just heard them singing. They took them nearly 10 minutes to greet us for the choir come in. And they were dancing and singing the whole way to the front of the church. And there's a couple of hundred people in the church. And these people literally have very, very little. But you know, we were the honored guests and they sacrificed chicken, they got rice out, and it was amazing. This scrawny chicken they offered us, you probably would have rejected at the local butchers. But for them, it was absolutely everything. And we praise God that they were willing to share their all with us. It was an amazing mm -hmm. experience. This is the VCI conference, and remember we took up a love offering here. We took out nearly a thousand pounds from the church here. And that thousand pounds helped pay for this conference and all the food because they all came, the pastors and their wives and leaders. They stayed, this is a school, and they stayed in the school overnight. They slept on floors in classrooms. Some of them had bunks, but they cooked all their meals there throughout the three-day conference. And I had the privilege of teaching at that conference along with Barb and Alex. We did some marriage uh, mm -hmm. teaching on there which was really gratefully received and we spoke on uh, leadership and visioning and what to do as a, a VCI in Zambia what a great conference time we had and then at the end of the conference I don't think we're actually uh, showing it yeah the, let's talk about this slide that's um, one of the choir members and she, you can see that she's got a baby on her back. That uh, it's a piece of cloth, obviously, that they uh, carry their children around with. And I, I tried to pick out the, the little girl's hands. Her mom, her mom is praising, and that little child is praising, uh, poking her hands out of the, the thing, the the carrier. And uh, so that choir that was um, at that that church and sang at the conference there, there was about. Well, there was a lot of them, and all the women virtually had got babies, and they went around and they got their babies on the back, and they were yeah. doing their choreography as well, weren't they? Amazing. Their songs, brilliant the harmonies and everything. And yeah. then at the conference, there was a Bible college graduation. Victory Churches in Zambia have their own Bible school, and there were 14 students who graduated on, the sat on that Saturday we were there. And uh, they have a, a brother by the name of Noah who runs the uh, Bible school. That's him at the extreme left of the picture. And uh, these students have really sacrificed to be able to come. A lot of them are doing other jobs as well as coming to Bible school, but uh, they are enjoying their Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah, and they do the victory. Um, curriculum, uh, the first year of it, that we virtually the same as we do, and uh, so they're really going places with yep. God, aren't they? Yep. Amen. Then, then out in Zambia, uh, there's, this is the title deed to new land that they purchased. The gentleman holding the title deed there is Pastor Kelvin, and he oversees the whole of the Victory Churches in Zambia. And Pastor Hazel and the board in Canada bought a plot of land, 100 meters square, uh, uh, yeah, 100 meters, that's right. So that's a chunk of land. It's a really good sized piece of land. But you know, in Africa, when they see, sad, I mean this very respectfully, but when they see Westerners come, Money is what they see. And what they did was uh, one of the gentlemen was sent 20,000 pounds from Canada and he did a runner with it. And he ran off to South Africa. You know, nothing corrupts like money. And when people don't have a lot and then into their bank account go or an account which they've got access to, 20,000 uh, pounds turns up. It's very tempting. So anyhow, eventually they, built, they bought a piece of land and in Ndola where they're going to build a church and a headquarters. And they ended up paying 20, another 20,000 Canadian dollars for the piece of land, which should have cost 5,000. But you know, it's quite close to the airport. And in the last two years, it's gone from being valued at 20,000 to over 40,000. I tell you, our God knows how to get the right piece of land. And we had the privilege of going on the land. And the pastors there are so excited because this is like the UK land registry. They have now got it registered in the Victory Church name. It can't be taken from them. And they're going to build a great church and a headquarters on that piece of land. They're now getting ready to drill a water hole. They've got to drill a borehole on it for the water and bring electricity onto site. But 
wow, what an exciting time it is for these guys. That place we were sitting in is a very famous place. If you, if you ask anybody where the hungry lion is, they'll know what you're talking about. We were sitting in the hungry lion in Sulwazy, I think, that day. Yeah, and the, like the hungry lion's a bit like McDonald's here, so it is, you know, so, but they call it the hungry lion. Hallelujah. And then this is at a place called uh, Kitwe, and in Kitwe, uh, they had a conference, of, and there were 50, they were expecting 50,000 people at the conference. It not, was, not in that building. Not in that way. building. This building. This is the building where we held the pastor's conference, the leader's conference on the morning. I had the privilege of speaking at it, but they were sharing about how they got 50,000 uh, people they were expecting to come. Now, mm. how are they going to keep contact with them, Mark? Yes, because this uh, minister's uh, event that we were at, they were actually organising the forthcoming uh, conference and uh, they were debating over how they were going to do the follow-up. And uh, what they said was, OK, well, we'll take the name and address, we'll write it on a card. And then somebody says, well, what if they don't have an address? Because actually a lot of them don't have an address. As you're driving along the road, you can see that people camp in all sorts of odd places. Um, anyway, so they said, OK, well, uh, to just take the phone number. And isn't it interesting that people who don't have an address have a phone? Apparently that is quite true in Zambia. Everybody has a phone. And uh, so, so you, you can still do your follow-up by phone. <laughs> now, it was amazing at this uh, minister's conference. There was about 108 ministers there. And I'm sitting on the front row. You know, sometimes when you go to a conference, you, can be quite intimidating. They were all doctors, bishops, and this, that, and the other. In fact, I went from being a pastor to a bishop, and I was a doctor before I left. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing <laughs> the promotion you can get. But anyhow, at this conference, I was sitting in the front row, and I'm saying, Lord, how do I introduce myself to these people? And the Lord said, the, 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 the Holy Spirit just says to me, give them your credentials. And I think, credentials? I wonder what you would do if the Lord said to you, give them your credentials. So I stood up in front of these men, and they were they only giving me 20 minutes max. And I said, my credentials are these, that I've walked with Jesus for 53 years. That I've been married to the same lady for 40 years. Our children are both pastors, and my house is in order, and I'm the pastor of a good church in the United Kingdom. These are my credentials. And then I launched into a prophetic word for that city and for the people there. Mm -hmm. They loved it. Apparently, it was very significant that he'd served the Lord for 53 years yep. because it was something to do with their uh, anniversary from independence. And it was 53 years this year. Yeah. Yep. So they really latched onto it. And um, what was a, a, a sort of ordinary prophetic word, God's going to poor abundance, etc. going to raise a tree up in the midst of the city. That's right. Yep. Um, they really believed it. You know, it, that makes me learn another lesson. They really believed what the man of God was saying. Yep. And at the end of the conference, at the end, I'd, so I took 17 minutes out of the 20. And at the end of the 17 minutes, the uh, senior pastor there says, Brother Will will pray for you at the end of the service. I thought, oh, that's okay, I can do that. Until I got to the end of the service. And the line stretched down the church, up the church, and down the church. And two hours, ten minutes later, I stopped praying and prophesying over individuals. It was the most amazing time. But I tell you, these people love God with all their heart. 50,000 people on a field the size of three football pitches. And they proclaimed Jesus for three nights in the city of Kitwe. It was a great place to visit. Then we're ready to travel. And you'll see that uh, on the back seat there was uh, green parcels. Uh, all our luggage had to be wrapped in green plastic bags because you'll see why, because of the dust. And ev dust got everywhere. And so they got Barb and I well kept apart with the cases between us. We took, uh, when we got to the airport, between four of us, we took 190 kilos of my stuff to the to uh, Zambia, we were allowed. Most of that was jewellery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We took five uh, over projectors like we have here. You're seeing these slides through this morning. There was a school closing in uh, Leeds. Alex got permission to take the projectors. So our hand luggage, each piece of hand luggage had a projector. There was projectors in our cases. We were sitting at the Heathrow Airport, swapping stuff between each other's case to try and balance out because we had roughly 24 kilos in each case, and we each had two cases. So it was 48 cases, uh, 48 kilos each. Uh, doubled up is 96, and you double that again, 
that's a lot of weight, I can assure you. And when we got that all out to Zambia, you, to, you gave such a blessing to the mm -hmm. churches in Zambia. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for all that you gave financially and the yeah. contribution yeah. you made with clothes, that you made with telephones, jewelry, telephones. It was scarves. amazing. Some These of, people. Um, they asked, uh, I don't know how many of you were here the day that I read out the list of things that uh, we, were suggested that we could take. And ladies' scarves were amongst it. And uh, some of us thought, well, on earth you want to have scarves out there? But actually, it's so that you can do all sorts of things, wrap around, carry your baby. Oh, and amazing. Yeah, it is. Um, and these so, people felt it was like Christmas. There were 13 yeah. churches at the conference, and Vicky Coatsy, who was with us, divided everything into 13 unique piles, and there were laptops we'd taken out as well. It was an amazing time to watch these people. But this is the day we packed up to travel. There, this is the roads we travelled on, and I can assure you they are bumpy. And the reason why we went to, uh, at night, or we started out during the day, is because of the next one. You'll see what happens during daylight. During daylight, that's what it's like. Trucks, lorries. Lorries come past you at 60 mile an hour over those bumps, and the, and the dust they threw up is unbelievable. So. What happened was, I go back to that one, this is the state of the roads, and we did a hundred, took us seven and a half hours to go 180 miles over roads like that. I have never been bounced around in the back of a car in all my life like I was that, for that seven and a half hours. And you would get 30 kilometers of uh, tarmac for their building new, a new road, and then you suddenly it says diversion, and you'd come off the tarmac, and this is the type of road you'd be on for the next 30 kilometers, and you're and you were bouncing around all over the place. It, it seemed as though we would never amazing. get to the well, end. we'd never get there. But in the end, we did. But that was the type of dust you had. When those lorries passed you, when you were driving, you literally could not see in front of you. You were driving by faith because you couldn't see the <laughs> road at the all. Next one. All oh, right, sorry, no. I thought we'd got No, we hadn't got anything. Okay. And then here is uh, Kelvin, the national leader. Uh, he's teaching in a city called Sulwazy, and this is one of the schools. And in this school, this is the senior grade, but in the junior grades, in the main church building, there were over 100 children uh, between two blackboards. So they had 25 children each side of the blackboard, and, and on different sides of the room. They had no chalk, they had no pens, they had no paper. Well, when we arrived, they had plenty of chalk, they had plenty of paper, they had plenty of pens, they got scissors and everything, and we had a great time. For those who blessed us to help the children, those children were greatly blessed. And uh, not only that, but we discovered there was no electricity in the place. Somebody had come along and ripped the electrics off the front of the building. So I said to the pastor, uh, I says, well, how much will it cost to have this fixed? And he says, it's really expensive. He says, it's uh, 200 kwacha. That's 20 pounds. I said, get the electrician in. So we paid the, the 200 kwachas, and two days later, the electricity was in. And he says, we even have enough to buy bulbs five pence a bulb and they built, bought bulbs and they lit up so those who blessed the schools that's what your money did mm -hmm. it blessed child upon child and they ran feeding programs didn't they Barbara? Uh, yep and I was going to say that the electricity of course runs the water pump yeah um, so that without the electricity they didn't have any water in the school etc yep. yeah so we ch helped change that now then there's some volume on this this is the sort of welcome that you get when you actually go to, uh, to visit, which is what we did, village after village after village. I was just taking a, uh, we just got out of the vehicle, everybody's gathered. And when you go, yeah, everybody sings. So Did you hear that? 
We are very happy to see you here. <laughs> okay, that's the okay. Uh, that's enough on that one. Thank you. And then so, here in the same school, this was a feeding program, cooking for the children. They daily feed over 200 children from the village. And that happens, there's Victory Churches have got four churches in this one city, and every church runs a feeding program where they feed between 100 and 200 children every day. It was just amazing. And you know, they would take us in to show us, and they were cooking over a little tiny stone fire, these huge pots, of, it's milly meal, it's a, a crushed, it's a corn which they've crushed down, and they make into, they call it pap, I think it is, and then they put a, a gravy with it, and the children eat that every day. And if it wasn't for that, these children would starve. And a lot of the money that we sent was buying milly meal and food for the weeks and months that lay ahead for these children. What a joy to think that you, say, that's me, that's you, you have helped give daily meals probably to somewhere in the region of four to 600 children for the last month. And then one day we went out, and this is Alex, and this is Eden in the wilderness. We'd went, we drove out of uh, Ndola near where we were staying and we drove about oh, an hour's drive and suddenly Alex says, oh, we've got to go left here and we turned up another one of those tracks but this track had bigger ruts. The van literally went from side to side. Mm -hmm. Eight kilometres up that road we came to this place. Yeah, and uh, this wasn't a victory uh, place, but it was somewhere that they wanted us to actually see because they uh, teach people. It's actually, as we go on to the next slide, you'll see that this is uh, a, a group of buildings. See those long thatched roofs there? They keep really nice and cool. And this is actually a university campus for teaching farming God's way an agricultural system that doesn't eat the seed, but actually farms um, in a conservative, in whatever way they call it. Um, they use uh, compost and they use wormeries, and, but they have to teach the Africans that. They also teach teachers here. So they train um, people and, and they disciple people as well for Jesus Christ. And the actual compound uh, is run by a South African ministry and uh, it's, but it was very, very peaceful. Yeah, we really amazing. loved it there, didn't we? Yeah. If you can imagine, everywhere we went was really brown and we drove around the corner and there was a lake and this place was as green as could be. And they'd got young men from the villages, four of them, with thatchers, and they were teaching them how to be thatchers. They'd got a young woman from one of the villages who showed an aptitude uh, for work, and they brought her and they taught her office work. And they started to teach her basic skills. Then if you go to this uh, place and you work with them, you have to uh, study in the mornings, but in the afternoons, everybody, no matter who they are, have to, has to spend time in either the kitchen, the uh, Come back a bit. either in the kitchen or they got to go to the uh, farm or they got to go to the wood workshop or the mechanic shop or in the office and they equipped you and trained you for the purpose of sharing the gospel in the ordinary community their philosophy was if there's an inflow there has to be an outflow you cannot just keep taking in and not giving out and they would equip all these amazing men and women to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether they were a farmer, whether they're a mechanic, whatever they were doing, everybody, if you had an inflow, you needed an outflow. This was a little haven, and I fell in love with the place. It was amazing. And we met some awesome people from South Africa, uh, India, Australia, America, all these students from all over the world were working there. And the day we arrived, they were just having lunch, and we had a picnic with us, so we put our picnic, and it's under a huge thatched roof with kitchens off it. And I've never been in a place where I felt the presence of God so powerful as I did on that campus. It was amazing. Okay. Here's a, somebody we want you to meet. His name, the gentleman beside me is, uh, is Pastor Banda from Lusaka. And he runs a ministry, God at Work for Kids. And Barb's going to share about mm -hmm. that. He was at our conference checking us out whether he wanted to become part of uh, Victory. Victory. And his story is actually remarkable. Um, you can see he's quite a small built man. Well, when he was a child, he was brought up in one of these African villages, uh, poverty, etc. So his parents moved their family to Lusaka, the city. 
and as they moved, uh, the father was seeking work and didn't really, wasn't very successful and decided to move back to where he'd come from. But this time, this man, whose name is Davis, he actually uh, was 15 years old and he said, no, I've come to the city, I'm going to make my way in life. And the, uh, what happened was they left him, they went back home, he's left there. But the family that he was staying with, sort of more extended family, I suppose, actually kicked Davis out. And they, they, he wasn't staying with them. Uh, he wasn't allowed to. And he ended up on the streets. And he was on the streets for three years. During that time, he started glue sniffing, petrol sniffing, spirit, methylated spirits. And he, he ended up in a terrible state, obviously. So one day he was begging. And he went up to this white guy and um, he was begging for, for money. And the white guy said to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Come over here and sit down for half an hour and I'll talk to you. And this man uh, took him through some Bible promises. And one of them was... Even though my mother and father forsake me, I, says the Lord, will never forsake you. And this white guy led Davis to the Lord. Well, that changed everything in his life. It was amazing. But he decided at that point that he was going to stop sniffing. And uh, as he, he did that, he decided, okay, I, I need to get work and stop begging. So he um, went to a local bakery and they gave him a job uh, sweeping up. But they didn't know he was homeless. And uh, anyway, after a week of him uh, doing this, he asked if they could help him find somewhere to live. And so they started to give him a loaf of bread and some milk and they did help him find somewhere. And uh, they even began to train him. They must have seen something good in him. And uh, he was trained as a chef. And then he moved on from the bakery into a couple of hotels and he, he learned how to be quite a good chef. He got the opportunity to work at the airport. And you can understand that in this poverty environment, actually working in somewhere like an airport is quite prestigious. There was actually three applications, 3,000 applications for five jobs. Anyway, um, the, the test that he had to go through was um, make sure you um, cook a, a meal for us, that's lovely, but you've got to do it in 20 minutes. He was ready in 15. He said, oh, you want a meal in uh, 20 minutes? I'll cook you a pizza. So he produced a pizza in, 20, in 15 minutes. And the rest of the chefs were still looking at their recipes and figuring out what they were going to do. The reason why he knew exactly what to do and wasn't looking at recipes was he couldn't read and write. He'd only ever had a first year of school, like age five education. And um, so uh, when it came to actually getting this job at the airport, he had got to sign papers. And so he said to one of his colleagues, his other uh, chap who'd been successful, can you put a mark for me? And the chap said, no, I'm not going to do that for you. If you can't read and write, you can't have this job. And there, of course, it's a really um, push and shove situation. Anyway, praise God, he did get he hired. Job, yeah. And they moved on from the airport to army. Now he's catering for 300. Air Force. Oh, sorry, Air, Air Force. Force. 300 people. And, uh, got and after, married. Yes, had a couple of children. And then he started to work for the military seniority. And this was a very prestigious catering job. And, of course, he was get, he'd got uh, accommodation and everything. And I don't know how long that went on for. He'd got a, a wife and two children, and he was in the Lord. He'd brought his wife to the Lord. And um, then he started to notice the street kids... And he realised that he'd been like that. And so he, I think, first of all, he had to take in orphans from uh, mm. extended family. And then he began to take into his home um, orphans who were, who were off the streets. But he realised that doing the job that he was doing, he couldn't actually do that in military accommodation. And um, so he decided he would switch jobs, bless him, and he became a builder. And so that's what he does today. And actually, he, he was exceptional. Yeah. Um, he said I, he doesn't come looking for money. Praise God. Um, but the, 
the actual um, income that he gets to support the people he has to support uh, is from the building work that he does. He's got a construction company, he employs people. Um, uh, he'd got a chap um, driving him Max. when we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, another co-pastor. He runs, was how many churches? Eight. Eight churches. In Zambia. In Zambia. Well, he decided that these orphans he was getting into his home, uh, there wasn't space for them, so he built a place. And it's called House of Joy. And uh, yes, it really is. It's beautiful, isn't it? Now, so uh, yeah, the, so that's him. And these are the children who now live in the house of joy with him. They all live together as a family. Twenty-four orphans, plus his own children. Thirty-two children living in their house. I don't think that actually, the, it, no. it, it does pick out the fact that he's got a nice floor and a, a wall and stuff. He's, I presume that it's living in a nice home, that we would call a nice home, which seemed to be the exception from yep. the homes that we went into. And um, so I really praise God. He is actually doing an amazing work. And he, he actually was very impressed with Will's prophecy to the ministers. And he came up to me afterwards because Will was prof prophesying everybody. And he said, um, I invite you to come and he to come um, into uh, to Lusaka. You can preach crusades. And actually he starts to show me on his phone pictures of not only the House of Joy, but also the crusades that he holds already. He's got the floodlights, he's got the they're open air, obviously. And um, and he want, he wants Will to go and preach. And he's talking to me. And so I'm saying, Oh well, that's nice. I think I need to check out this guy first. <laughs> And uh, anyway, so um, then we got on to the next day and he's still talking about it. And he said, you can come and stay at my house. I looked at him. I said, stay at your house. You've got 32 kids living in your house. I'll stay in a hotel. <laughs> and he, he really looked offended. <laughs> Dear his poor face. So, so anyway, the... Um, uh, when we were actually going, I realised that the, this man is, is the real thing. And, um, and so I said to him, well, because he said on the last day, you are my mama. And I thought to myself, oh dear, what does that entail? And um, Come and stay in his house. <laughs> stay. So I said, well, if I'm your mother, I better come and stay at your house. <laughs> so I need a lot of grace yeah. if, if ever we do get to Lusaka. Yeah. He's planning for... Uh, for us to go to Lusaka next year. And he showed me pictures of his conferences he does, and there are thousands of people turn up at them. And uh, I've got the privilege, along with Barb, of going, and we're going to stay, we probably will stay in his house. It's a beautiful house. Mm -hmm. And his construction company, you know, there's a lot of construction going on in Zambia at the moment. And he taught himself to bricklay, and then he taught other guys to bricklay. That's how he got his business going. And then what he did was, uh, he went out and he went, saw these companies, they put up uh, metal work, you know, frames, big metal work, uh, and, and they block in between all the, the frames. So he's now got a gang of men who go around doing all the block work on these buildings, and that's how he raises the money. You've got to understand AIDS is a huge problem out mm -hmm. here in uh, Zambia, and his sisters and her husband died of AIDS, and he has their children, he looks after them. We went to quite a few villages and where people were looking, grandparents were looking after children. And you know, we met one young man and his name... Uh, Felix. Felix. Uh, Felix worked for the Methodist Church, and what a humble, humble man of God he was. Eight years he's been studying to become a minister in the Methodist Church. But he believes that we're called to build the kingdom of God. And he, his heart was to help the elderly as well as the young. So they would do feeding programs. He'd got a farm. They'd got 40-something goats. By the way, the goats we bought last year, the billy goat's been doing his job, and there's lots of tiny little goats. Excellent job. Hallelujah. Uh, the chicken run has come to an end, uh, so, but they're, they're keeping working on the billy. They were, I got involved. I'd never, ever been involved in family planning of goats before until this summer. So they were working out how to get this farmer's goat to this nanny goat and swapping them across so there was no wind breeding. But we got that sorted out. But it was a great time. But this guy, Felix, feeding the people. He takes vegetables and fruit, fish from their fish farms into the villages and blesses people. And in one village there was an old lady and uh, uh, in a little straw hut. I mean straw around the sides, 12 foot diameter, straw roof. And two of her grandchildren were living with her because their parents had died of AIDS. And he went and he got some builders and building friends. And he says, come, we're going to build this elderly lady. She doesn't go to his church, doesn't go to any church, 
But they went and they built her a house, 12 foot by 10 foot, something that may have been 14 by 10. One big room and windows in it, all uh, block work and a tin roof. And the old lady stood and cried because she'd never lived in a house with a tin roof. It always had been grass roofs and the rain would come in through the thatch. Mm -hmm. And uh, what she was worried about her grandchildren was that there were snakes around. She was always afraid of snakes killing her grandkids. Well, she moved into the new house, which was only 10 or 12 feet from the old house. And a, few, a week or so after moving into the house, her goats, which were now occupying the old house, one was dead. And a snake, a very poisonous snake, had got in right through the area where her grandchildren would have been sleeping just weeks ago. And here she was, safe and sound in her home. You know, that's what it takes. Someone who has got a vision and a dream, didn't matter who the people were, didn't matter they went to his church or not, he saw a need and he went to meet the need. You know, he had uh, discovered a purpose in life for himself. One of the things we have discovered is that... Uh, in our future, Barb and I, we, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I'm, we're going to go to the mission field. And uh, uh, when I was in Zambia, it got right under my skin, into my blood. I just love missions. And I can't wait for the day, and not that I want to leave here tomorrow or anything out there, but there's a day coming when we will go. There's a day coming when the sacrifices we made to pastor here, God will require us to make even bigger sacrifices to live on the mission field. But the mission field is where we believe we're called for the next 10 years or so of our lives, that we might give the very best of God. When you get to know God, you don't retire. Brothers and sisters, it's a refiring. He may not take you to the uttermost parts of the earth, but I know that's where he's for taking us. Mm -hmm. But you may just be called to live in your community, but just don't retire. Spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell people about the love of God. Discover God's purpose for your life. And as I read in, uh, you see, Moses, he discovered God's purpose for his life. Moses was brought up uh, amongst the, the, uh, the Egyptians, but God sent him back to deliver the Egyptians. The widow of Zarephath, you know, she had uh, uh, oil which she kept pouring out and she fed and she also fed the prophet. We know there's the other, the widow, and uh, uh, the, the, the prophet came and they built a, a house for the prophet and we know that uh, the pro she got the prophet's reward because the prophet brought her son, her child, her only child back to life in Jesus' name. David discovered that he had a purpose in life, not only as a shepherd boy, but as a giant killer and eventually to be a king. You need to see and understand that Jesus came to fulfill the purpose of his father and his father's purpose and heart was that none of his creation should perish and Jesus came to fulfill that and no one else could fulfill it but Jesus but he discovered he had a purpose and that's why for Barb and I as your pastors now we want you to be able to discover what is God's purpose for your life for for the next 20 years or 10 mm -hmm. years or even five years for what is life. God called for life it's yes. for life mm -hmm. isn't it yep. the it's not uh, a case of uh, whatever age we are at God's got a purpose for us now and th this has uh, really been uh, etched into us uh, because we've got all sorts of experience. All, all of us have got loads of gifts, spiritual and practical. And there's all sorts of things that God um, actually prompts us to do. And sometimes um, it's inconvenient or it would cost us too much or it looks absolutely impossible and we can't do it. And so we discount what God has said. And if there's a, um, an instance like that in your life, I want to tell you it's not too late. Amen. Because the Bible tells us that the gifts and call of God oh, are that. irrevocable. Mm -hmm. And that call goes on and on. And, and sometimes <laughs> even through our disobedience, the Holy Spirit is still speaking. And I wanted to uh, actually, I don't know whether any of you have got a Bible, we could perhaps turn on the, uh, the screen there to Acts 26. I thought the young people, by the way, last week were a great example of, open your Bibles. I thought, yes, open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts 26. And it's Paul recounting his experience um, when God called him. Um, in Acts 26, he's talking to a king. He's having to justify why he shouldn't be killed, and he appeals to Caesar. But um, in uh, verse 12, I'll start to read from verse 12 of Acts 26. 
While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when, all, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I'd just like to pause there a minute and say, Paul was doing what he considered was his commission. And he's, uh, at that stage, he was wholeheartedly, zealously following the Jewish way of doing things. And God arrested him in uh, mid-distance, as it were. He'd already done loads of harm to Christians. And so a light comes on his life and I wonder if any of you I think probably many of us in this room have had an experience where God has challenged us or called us and we've heard the voice of the Holy Spirit somehow actually speaking to us to do such and such that's exactly what happened to Paul he said um, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks and sometimes you know it uh, in our lives what we're doing or have been doing for a long time, it gets a bit hard work. And we realise that the Holy Spirit's not with us, helping us the same. Of course he's with us, but he's not. The actual anointing that we once enjoyed isn't there anymore. And what's God got to say in that? Um, it's What happened to Saul is this. Um, so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness. And that's all of our commission, to some degree. God wants to actually appear to you and say, I've called you. I've called you to be a minister. Every single one of us have got a ministry in whatever sphere of gifting he has given to us. We are being built together as Amen. a family of living stones where none of us is redundant. None of us has uh, got... A, we, we, nobody's a spare part here. And there, God is actually calling us all, at whatever age we are, to say, OK, Lord, what can I do for you? And Paul was told to rise and stand on his feet. And uh, I would like to actually get us um, as a response to the challenge that we're giving you this morning. For this purpose, you are here today. It's not an accident that you are here. It's not an accident that, or your decision or somebody else's decision. Because God has orchestrated events in your life and he has a purpose for you. So I'd like for us to actually rise and stand together. Musicians, if you could come. Rise and stand on your feet. For this purpose, you are here today. It can be all sorts of ministries, all sorts of situations, yeah, God may not be calling you to go to the nations like he is us, but he is calling you to tell your neighbor, to tell your friend, to tell your children, to do what he has called you to do, to find purpose for life. Mm. And I want you, no matter what age you are this morning, to discover that purpose for your life. It's great to walk in his purposes. And the song we're going to sing is entitled, it's a Come Away With Me. Mm -hmm. and the Lord is calling you and I and Barb mm -hmm. to come with him to walk with him to do what he calls in us to do <laughs> for his glory and for yeah. his honour it mentions that there's, he's got a plan for us yep. a wild plan yes, a Lord. good plan a good plan a plan that's full of him and you know it will require sacrifice whatever he calls you to do but it's worth it it really is worth it somebody said to me can I come with you to Zambia next year Will I said yep of course you can I'll advertise it. If anybody wants to come to Zambia next year, you're welcome to come. You say, how much is it going to cost? That's not the first question. Mm. The first question is, has God called you? 
Yeah. If God's called you, he'll make the provision. If you want to go, let me know. We'll stand in faith with you. I'd love to take a team to Zambia and see God do great and awesome things in each of your lives. In Jesus' name, amen. He wants to come in. Amen. <laughs> come away with me, okay, Joy? As we sing this song, I want you to actually sing it prayerfully. Not just as a, um, if any of you do need to go, feel free. But uh, the, those of you who want to really listen to God and come away with him, I invite you to come forward. Because we'd like to pray for you. And that you can get commissioned into the right sphere of service, the right relationships with the people around you that can serve with you. So let's move together on it. Let's take this time to pray as we sing.